Hi there. Hi. Good morning to you. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Uh, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, Jacqueline. Hi. Hey, Steven. What's good? What's up? What's up? Renee. Pittsburgh. Really cool. Thanks, Sheila. Where's everybody else at? Good morning, Shan. Hey, Brendan. Hello. Hey, Renee. Perky Lala, New Mexico. Arizona, Eric's in Arizona. Bartos, hey, hello, hello. Gillis, Brian. Hi, Judy. Good morning. Uh, the weather is, it's, uh, it's not, you know, it's cloudy, but it's, it's warm enough for me. Alabama, New York. Susie in Ohio. <laughs> Slovakia. Well, good afternoon to you, or maybe maybe good evening. Alba, Albuquerque. It always reminds me of Bugs Bunny. St. Thomas. Awesome. I was there in December of 2020. Beautiful place. Hi. Thank you, Boyka. New Jersey. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and get started with today's walk talk. First, before I begin, Riverside, California. Before I begin, let me go ahead and introduce myself just in case you're new to my ministry. My name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Be sure to check them out if you get some time. I have a podcast and the podcast is called Walk Talks with Matt McMillan and I'm shooting the latest episode right now <laughs> and you are live in the studio audience. <laughs> oh, St. Louis. Really cool. Uh, what else about me? I'm not a pastor. Oh, also I'm on YouTube. You can check me out on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel now. Uh, let's see what else. I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. Not that pastors aren't regular people, but I want to help renew your mind to the word pastor because it's only used once in the New Testament and it's listed as a spiritual gift in Ephesians chapter four. And we see nothing else about pastor, nothing. We see no qualifications. We see no authority. We see nothing about a pastor. So what's that tell us? What we see today in our modern church with the people who are up on stage telling everybody their opinion, whether it's truthful or not, that's not in the Bible. So when we look at the Bible, we see the Bible as a group of individuals as a whole. We see no leader except for Jesus. We see no person up on stage telling everybody what to think, telling everybody what to do. That's not in the Bible. Some people will also say that a bishop, elder, or deacon could also take that position, but the same thing applies. The word bishop is not in the most updated translations. It's been replaced with elder or deacon. The word elder and deacon combined is about 70 times in the New Testament, but those are not pastors. <laughs> and we see only qualifications for elders and deacons, not authority. So what's that tell you? Nobody has authority over you. So when you're giving somebody with that made up position of pastor authority, or you give somebody with that made up well, it's not even made up. Elder and deacon is a, we'll call it a position, just because of it has so many qualifications to have it, but they still have no authority over you. Authority, what does authority mean? Authority means they can cause you punishment. They can't. Nobody has authority over you. We are to respect our elders. We are to respect those who are older or mature in the faith, but they have no right to punish you. So that should renew your mind to those things as far as a pastor is concerned. What is a pastor? If we see no qualifications, we see no authority in the Bible, what is it? Look at Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was the ultimate pastor. He had that shepherding gift. The word pastor simply means overseer or shepherd. What did Jesus do? Jesus didn't punish anybody. He went around correcting and loving and leading. That's what a true pastor does. But what we see today 
as far as what we have named pastor, that's not in the Bible. We want it to be in the Bible because we have this system set up, but it's not there. So I think we need to reshape what we see today. I'm not saying shut down the churches. I'm saying let's reshape our churches based on what scripture says, not try to reshape scripture based on what man says. Even when we look at what we have named the pastoral letters, air quotes, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, the word pastor is not in those books. We want those to be pastoral letters. When I say we, I'm talking about humanity. It's not there. So I say these things in my introductions about pastors and about the church and about elders because I want to help you understand that you don't need to look to any individual person for every answer. You don't need to look to every individual person to check in with them. Even in the New Covenant camp, we have some people in the New Covenant camp, their entire ministry, even though they understand the New Covenant, is set up on knowing everything. You've never heard them say, you might be right. I'll look into that. It's you're wrong. I'm right. Get in line. It's almost cultish where we see one individual that everybody has to bow down to get every answer from it's that's not how it is in the bible so let's reshape this you know and when we see cults we see people who protect those leaders it's in the new covenant camp too not just in the people who mix the covenants but in the new covenant camp i have personally been attacked by people who are sticking up for a different new covenant teacher the gospel's much older than this person or these individuals. So we have to stop looking to individuals who think they know everything, never show any type of love, never show any type of anything except I'm a New Testament or I'm a New Covenant encyclopedia, I'm a New Covenant encyclopedia. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not interested in it. So let's get away from the pastoral worship, whether it's covenant mixture pastoral worship or New Covenant pastoral worship. Let's get back to a group. Let's get back to a body. We don't have to look to one individual person who gets to pick out certain words and define whether or not those are good or bad. They don't know everything. They don't have every answer. Who does? The spirit. And the spirit lives in you. The spirit guides you. That's all you need to know is what the spirit has taught you so far. So if you want to contact me, I always welcome your interaction. Please reach out. You can reach out to me on my website. Go to my website, go over to the contact page, shoot me a message, I'll be glad to interact with you. My website is mattmcmillan.com. You can just Google me, or you can go to the link in my bio if you're watching this live on Instagram. Now, if you message me, I don't respond to messages. That's set up for uh, my personal relationships. So if you wanna contact me and you message me via Messenger or Instagram, I'm not gonna respond. Email me. Now, here's another thing. If you continually email me rude things or obsessive things, I'm going to step back from that and I'm not going to reply to that either. I have healthy boundaries. So just because I'm opening up the opportunity for you to contact me doesn't mean you can abuse contacting me. Okay. All right. So <laughs> let's go ahead. I don't know where all that came from. <laughs> Something I was thinking about, I guess. Let's go ahead and get to today's walk talks. Are Christians sinners? saints or both are Christians sinners saints or a combination both our modern church and when I say modern church I'm talking about the body of believers who are alive today we have an identity crisis we do not know who we are when you don't know who you are you're not gonna live that way when you don't know who you are you're gonna confuse what you do with who you are but if we can just go back to the Bible and begin reading scripture based on what Christ has done, not just through the cross, but also through the resurrection, knowing who we are gets pretty simple. We can then define, okay, that's not really for me. That definitely is for me, okay? And then over time, your conscience can be retrained by way of the Holy Spirit within you. Okay, he is your ultimate teacher. He is your ultimate shepherd. He is ultimately the one who will lead you into all peace, comfort, confidence, and a sound mind. Okay, so let the opposite of those things be a red flag for you. If it's not peaceful, it's 
not from God. If it's not comforting, it's not from God. If it doesn't give you a sound mind, it's not from God. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter. Some people say, you should be telling people to get comfortable. <laughs> okay, what should I tell what should I tell them the Holy Spirit is named? He's named the comforter. You're the one who doesn't want them to be comfortable because you want them to be like you and they don't want to be like you. They've got no interest in that whatsoever. So when I say get comfortable, I'm talking about be comfortable like a branch is connected to a vine. Now in your mind, as you learn these new truths, you are going to be uncomfortable in your mind, but not in who you are. You are complete. Your old thought patterns, your old coping mechanisms, your conscience will be uncomfortable, but that's not you. As you renew your mind to the truth of who you are, those uncomfortable thoughts fade away. So are, are Christians sinners, saints, or both? When we can define these three things, our mind gets renewed and then we become comfortable with who we are. Okay, so let's go ahead and break down all three. Let's break down what a sinner is according to scripture. Let's break down what a saint is according to scripture. And then let's break down what a combination of a sinner and a saint is according to scripture. So first of all, the word sinner, when we see the word sinner in the Bible, it's listed about 70 times. Now, when I do these walk talks with you, when I'm listing off a numerical equation of scriptures or words, I invite you to study this with me. I know you can't stop and study it right now because I'm talking to you, but if you are listening to this later on, or if you want to go back and study, please do. I highly recommend using Bible Gateway. Go to Bible Gateway, type in the word that you have questions about, type in the phrase that you have questions about, type in whatever subject you have questions about, and it will pull that up in the Bible Okay, and then it will help you understand the context behind each individual word. When we look for the word sinner in scripture, depending on the translation, it's used a total of 70 times in the Bible. When you combine the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word sinner is listed 70 times. Now, when we see the word sinner in the Old Testament, it is referring to those who broke the commandments of the law. What is a sin according to the Old Testament, according to the Old Covenant? It's not random. It's 613 different ways to sin. It's defined. Sin was brought in. The law was brought in so that you could see sin. Romans chapter 5. The law was brought in so you could define sin because these Jews wanted to define what was right and wrong. So the law came through Moses. Okay, so when we see the word sinner in the Old Testament, it is referring to those who were breaking the commandments of Moses. Were you following the commandments of Moses? No. Was I? No. We are who they called sinners naturally, the Gentiles. So when you read the Psalms and the Proverbs and you see sinner, 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 it is referring to either a Jew who is not doing a good job of obeying the commandments of Moses or a Gentile who doesn't even have the option of that. It's not talking about you today, me today, anything that we're doing. So when you read the Old Testament and you see the word sinner, that's what it is. Now, here's another thing that I got to point out, because a lot of people, especially in the Hebrew roots movements that try to push the law onto people, they'll say the law is what defines sin. Oh, no. The law was brought in so that sin would increase. We see the word sinner used in Genesis before the law was given, thus proving that there were sinners before the law. What is a sinner? A sinner is somebody who does not believe God. 
That is what a sinner is. Now, when we look to the four gospels, we see Jesus ripping into people who were calling other people sinners. So the word sinner in the four gospels is used about 30 times. Out of the 70 in scripture, we see the word sinner or sinners used about 30 times, depending on your translation in the four gospels. Now, when we look at this, every single time you see the word sinner, every single time you see the word sinner, it's never describing somebody who has believed God. The word sinner is somebody who has not believed God. Now, here's another thing. There were people being accused of being a sinner in the four gospels who were not sinners. This is why Jesus, because they had believed God. Okay, the righteous have always lived by faith, even before the law. Abraham believed God and he was righteous. His faith did not waver, but he didn't have the law. And his faith did not waver, but he did all this stuff with Ishmael. <laughs> do you see it? Humanity wants to define a sinner as what you do. This is why all of the Pharisees, who never called themselves sinners, followed Jesus around calling him a sinner, calling the people who he was hanging out with sinners, but never called themselves sinners because they found their righteousness in what they did according to the law, not in what they believed. They did not believe God. So a sinner, according to scripture, is somebody who has not believed God. It is not what you do. A sinner is not what you do, according to the Bible. Go read all of the passages. Read every single passage about sinner. When you read that passage, understand that's an identity passage. Sometimes people were being accused of being a sinner and they weren't. Sometimes people were claiming righteousness and they weren't. Do you see it? Sinner is not what you do. Sinner is who you are by what you have believed. Okay, now this is also just a, a quick side note here. This is also why Paul called himself the chief of sinners. I'm going to let that marinate for just a second. When Paul called himself the chief of sinners, he was just referring to what I was just referring to. His devout life as a Pharisee. He would have been somebody who followed Jesus around, rebuking him for doing miracles on the Sabbath. He was the chief of the sinners. That's why he said that. How did he sin? according to the law. Because if you don't follow the law perfectly, that's why Jesus said, be perfect like God to the people who thought they were doing that. You're a sinner. So Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners, Timothy. And if God can show me mercy, he can show mercy to anyone. Paul's not referring to his current life. This is the same apostle who wrote to the saints in Rome, to the saints in Ephesus. I'm gonna get to saints here in just a second. To the saints in Colossae. He knew that when he was a Pharisee, he was a sinner because he did not believe God. So when you do not believe God, you are a sinner. You know, we see this today in our modern church. We get people up on stage and they want to call everybody sinners. <laughs> Ding dong. Ding dong. Who's the real sinners? Is it the one up on stage calling people sinners? Is it the one who says this man uh, hangs out with sinners? <laughs> Sinner is an identity passage, both before and after the cross. All right, let's go on to saint. Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. When I, <laughs> I can just feel myself start to get <laughs> excited about it, excited because I'm a saint. I'm a saint. There's a Lecrae song. I don't know if you guys listen to any kind of Christian rap music, but there's a, a Lecrae song before I understood, understood the new covenant. He had a, um, a song and it still has it. It's called I'm a saint by Lecrae. I and mean, I used to bump that, but I never really understood the words and Lecrae did not understand the new covenant. I don't know if he still does or not. There's a lot of covenant mixture theology, whole different topic, but you are a saint. If you have believed in Jesus by grace, 
So is the Christian a sinner, a saint, or both? I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna button it up by putting all three of them together at the end. But you are a saint. Saint, becoming a saint is not bestowed upon you. You don't get it by doing something. You don't, it's not something that somebody awards to you, like you're a saint and then crowns you. No, not according to scripture. So let's break this down. The word saint means holy one. The word saint means sanctified one. All right. This is, pay close attention to this. This is really going to help you if you don't understand your identity. The only thing that could possibly cause you to become sanctified, which is what a saint is. A saint is the verb, excuse me, the saint is the noun of what you are. Sanctified describes you. Okay. The only thing that could possibly cause you to become a saint, something that any something that can cause you to become sanctified is blood. That's it. Only blood can sanctify you. That's it. You cannot sanctify yourself. Sanctification is not a process. It's not ongoing. Sanctification is not something that you're getting little by little by little. Sanctification is not something that God sees you with sanctification glasses on. No, take the glasses off. God sees you for who you are. He doesn't, you don't have to have sanctific- uh, blood-colored glasses on. God sees you for who you are. You have been sanctified. So when we look at sanctification in Scripture, let's look at the sanctification before the cross and then after the cross. Because the word saint is used about 70 times in the Bible, which is sanctified one. Before the cross, <laughs> this is great. This is, uh, uh, get excited about this. Before the cross, the word saint is only used about 10 times. After the cross, about 60. Again, de- depending on your translation. What happened? <laughs> Why did they have all this scripture where they never called anybody saints? And then they're calling everybody a saint after that. See, saint over 60 times after Jesus went to the cross, because the cross. So before the cross, the Jews, when they broke one of the 613 commandments, those tallied up all year long. So they'd break one of the 10, break one of the other 603. They could not do anything about those sins. Those were transgressions of the law. They broke the law. Something had to be done about those sins. What was gonna be done? The annual day of atonement. They would take their blood, they'd take their animal to the temple. They would present this animal at the temple through the priest. The priest would then go back to the altar, kill the animal on the altar, and then that would atone for all of the sins for the past year. It would put it on a credit card, so to speak. It didn't permanently pay it off, but it temporarily did. At that point, they were sanctified. They had been sanctified right then. That animal blood sanctified them for the past year. The problem with this is, as soon as they left the temple, walked down the stairs, as soon as they left the temple, walked down the stairs and broke one of the commandments, they're no longer sanctified. Now they're sanctified is go- their sanctification is gone. It was year after year after year after year after year They went back again, they went back again, they went back again, they went back again. And then the animal blood would cover the sins, they do it again. This is why the work was never done through the Levitical priest. Hebrews chapter 9, chapter 10 talk about this in great detail. The Levitical priest would do this year after year, atone for the sins, and then they'd have to do it again the next year. This is why Hebrews 10 26 says there's no sacrifice left for sins. That's not Jesus. That's animal blood sacrifice. But when we look at how people were sanctified before the cross, it only happened until they broke another one of those 613. Had to be repeated the next year. They didn't stop and ask for forgiveness. The words ask for forgiveness aren't in the Bible. You have to have blood shed to be forgiven. You have to have blood shed to be sanctified. Hebrews 9.22. 
You have to. But Hebrews 7.22 says, or it might be 9.22, no, 7.22, says the animal blood could not take away the sin. Jesus comes along and takes away the sin. So when Jesus comes along, Jesus offered his blood at the real temple in heaven. Not this man-made shadow. This is a shadow of what was to come in Christ. <sighs> So Jesus offered his blood when he went to the cross for all of your sins once and for all time in heaven. After he had, Hebrews 1, 3, after he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down. There were no chairs in the temple. The Levitical priests were not allowed to sit down because the work was never done. Jesus comes along, offers his blood one time. He doesn't atone for sins, which is Put it on a credit card he propitiates them which means poof, takes them away banish them as far as the east is from the west they're gone he remembers your sins no more <laughs> Ooh, this, is great. this is good news right here so the religious mind and it's the same religious mind today as it was back then is the religious mind thinks you're telling people to sin This didn't just start with our modern church. Back then, too. That's why Paul said, should we continue sinning? Certainly not. Just because I'm saying you're forgiven doesn't mean I'm telling you to sin. Because they combine those two together because they don't understand. Your, your sinning does not define you. Your identity does. But we have been sanctified. Past tense. We are not being sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, by one offering, you have been sanctified. Past tense. Hebrews 10, 14, you have been made perfect. You know, there's a translation that says those who are being made perfect. The original text was not written that way. It is you have been made perfect. But yeah, I could even work with that because even if it does say those who are being made perfect, that's not people who are doing anything. That is those who will believe in the future. You have to deal with the fact that the blood of Jesus has sanctified you, past tense, once and for all time, because the only way you could be more sanctified or be more of a saint is if Jesus dies again and offers his blood up again and again. That's why the author of Hebrews says, Christ would have had to die repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but he is not done, he's not doing that. It's finished, this Old Testament system, of ongoing sanctification, ongoing sanctification, it is no more. And if you continue to look to that system, there's nothing but a, a fearful judgment coming because you're trampling on the spirit of grace. One offering is graceful. <laughs> if God is saying, I already know all about your future sins. I already seen all your past sins, but I'm deciding not to hold those against you because of what my son has done and your belief in that. So by one offering, you have been sanctified. Past tense. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 10. We, we also see this in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. You have been sanctified. Past tense. But those who confuse what you do with who you are will say, no, you got to do stuff to sanctify yourself in an ongoing manner. But that's not in the Bible. That's nowhere to be found. The only thing that could possibly cause you to become sanctified more is if Jesus comes back down from his ascension, goes back into the tomb, gets back up on the cross, sheds his blood again. That's the only thing that could possibly cause you to be more sanctified or to become a saint Again, you are a saint. That's why Paul said in the book of Acts, you are among those who have been sanctified. You are among those who are sanctified. What caused that? You repented from unbelief in Christ towards belief in Christ. It is the repentance of faith. I don't believe that to... I believe that. I need that. I want that. Can I have it? <laughs> you don't even have to say those things. It is hearing with faith. 
Paul told the Galatians that. It is by hearing with faith you are saved. Okay? So that is how you become sanctified. So when Paul wrote all of his different letters, he called them saints. To the saints in Rome, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Ephesians, or to the, to the saints in Ephesus, they were the Ephesians, to the saints in class. He's calling them all saints. So he always starts out with identity. That's what I try to do. <laughs> I, you know, I get accused of uh, being easy on sin. I am not easy on sin. <laughs> I'm probably more strict on sin than you are because I make a bigger deal of Jesus. You don't make a big enough deal of Jesus. If you made a bigger deal of Jesus, you would be, uh, you would understand just how detrimental sin was <laughs> and why Jesus had to die. But you're being light on sin. Because you're saying you could possibly continually do something to sanctify yourself, which the blood of Jesus already saying. The people who are truly light on sin are the people who truly do not appreciate what Jesus has done. They just don't get it. <laughs> Sinning will never bring you fulfillment. Sinning will cause you problems here on earth. But you're still forgiven. You're still righteous. You're still a saint. You're still sanctified. You're still a holy one. Deal with it. <laughs> I say that with all love. Deal with it. Deal with your perfection. Deal with your... You have been made perfect. You hear it all the time. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But you are perfect. You're perfect. Please. Just... All right. I'm a little triggered right now. Because I hear it so much, I just I, you just see it all over social media. People trying to be, uh, and it's, oh, just pump your brakes, McMillan. Let's get back on topic here. <laughs> okay. So, um, what made you perfect? The blood of Jesus. Period. The Jews would not believe this. They wanted to continually sin according to the law of Moses. They were deliberately sinning. And they're like, I do not believe in the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. I'm going to go to this big old temple where everybody still goes and I'm going to hand off my goat to the Levitical priest and get my forgiveness. <laughs> they were trampling on the spirit of grace. Grace is saying, you're forgiven. They didn't like grace. Grace is the opposite of the law. Grace is the opposite of everything that has to do with Judaism. In regard to Judaism for righteousness. Even the Jews for today. You know, I don't like... <laughs> Some people think I'm picking on Jews. I'm really not picking on Jews, but Jesus was a Jew and the whole system, the whole uh, race carried the oracles of God. So, you know, I, I talk about the Jews all the time. The, the righteous have always lived by faith. There's nothing wrong with Jews. There were believing Jews and unbelieving Jews back then and today. But the Jews for today who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they are in a state of limbo. They have no way to be forgiven. This is why, and a lot of people don't know this, this is why they have made this idol out of this old wall from Jerusalem. They stick notes in the crack, begging God to hurry up and send the Messiah. You see them, you know, wailing at this wall. They call it the wailing wall. It's, they just won't believe. They, they, want, they want the Messiah. They, they want Jesus to not be who he was. But it's not all of them. A lot of them do believe. You know, the early church, they were all Jewish. So it's, it's about faith. It's about faith. And when you believe Jesus has forgiven you, you have been sanctified. You become a saint. You become a holy one. Holy means set apart. That's it. And it is your identity. And you, what have you been set apart from? You've been set apart from this world, sin, and death supernaturally. Those are the three things you've been set apart from. This physical world, the power of sin, and death, those three things, scripture says, you have been set apart from. 
you're, you're holy. Who has done this? Jesus. You have been placed into him. All right. So let's get to the next option. Are Christians sinners, saints, or a combo of both? So we went over sinner. We went over saint. So now let's talk about a Christian being a combination of both sinner and saint. Okay. When I talk about this, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to be respectful. So Yes, that's what I'm going to do. I'm deciding right now. <laughs> All right. So let's just do this. You cannot be both. Let's start out with that. You cannot be both a sinner and a saint. Darkness has no place in with light. You can't be both. You're not both. You are not a sinner and a saint. You can it's an impossibility. If you were a sinner, you could not be a saint. If you were a saint, you could not be a sinner. Here's the problem. Because our modern church sees the word sinner as an action, they think that that is what you are. Same thing as the Pharisees. You know, I just went over this. First third of the walk talk about sinners. The word sinner is an identity passage in the Bible. Anytime I say you're not a sinner, the first rebuttal is Paul called himself the chief of sinners. But in context, Paul is referring to his life as an unbelieving Pharisee. He's telling a past tense story to Timothy about how he used to be a persecutor of the church. And he's using himself as the best example of how God can change a person. He was the chief of the sinners of the Pharisees He's from the tribe of Benjamin found fault, faultless according to all of them. He was rich. He, he was smart and he gave all of that sinner stuff up to become a saint through Christ. He knew how the Jews did. He knew that he, he was there at the day of atonement every single year. He handed off his bull, goat, lamb. That's what he was a sinner. You're not a sinner if you've believed in Jesus by grace. And you can't be both a sinner and a saint because darkness and light do not have fellowship with one another. So you can't have both of those in you. Look at it this way. Everything sinful about you died on the cross with Jesus. It, it had to happen. Romans chapter six says your old self died. Why would your old self need to die? Because it was sinful. Because you were born sinful by no fault of your own because of what Adam has done. Your old self died. Everything sinful about you died. You have been crucified. Galatians chapter 2. You are now complete. Colossians chapter 2. It wasn't just Jesus who died on the cross. You died with him. You were in Christ when Christ died. Christ died to sin because you were in Christ when Christ died. Did Christ need to die to sin? No, he was perfect. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. But you supernaturally, God is not bound by time. You were literally inside Jesus when he died. So you were crucified too. Everything sinful about you has died. So if you're going to call yourself a sinner, you're saying that that sinful person who's already died has come back to life. So why do I sin then? Because you're a human, because you still live on planet earth, because there is a force called hamartia that infects your members, your physical members. We see this in Romans chapter seven, but you are not sin. You are not hamartia. It is like a parasite. It's a tumor. It is an influence, but it's not you. And when you choose to express hamartia, you're already forgiven because of the cross. But not just that, you're righteous too. So the cross was the mercy. The resurrection was grace. Grace is an undeserved gift. So the cross forgave you. The resurrection gave you righteousness. So you're forgiven and righteous. Second Corinthians 5 
He no longer holds your sins against you. So when you choose to sin, you're choosing to do something that you have already died to. That's not natural for you, but you can do that because you still live here and the power of sin is still here. When we get a new planet, the power of sin is going to be gone. It's going to be all be brand new. You will not be influenced by sin ever again. So you can walk that way, but it's just a walk. You have a new practice of righteousness. You know, so many people want to go to the book of first John and they want to use the book of first John as a prescription for just like the Pharisees did. Not a description of. When you read the book of 1 John, it is describing people, not prescribing people. As in, do this and that's what you are. You know, people want to say a, a habitual sin is a practice of sin. No, it's not. A practice of sin is something that you do organically because that's who you are. It's an ongoing thing to get better at because that's who you are. You are righteous. So you have a new practice of righteousness. You're not a sinner. If you were a sinner, what should you be doing? Sinning. If you're righteous, what should you be doing? Righteousing. <laughs> I know it's not a word, but low hanging fruit. Look, look at this way. You are now, you're a saint who sometimes sins, not a sinner who sometimes saints. Flip it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're, you're not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm both Macmillan, but you're not. You're a saint saved by grace. Identity, 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 identity. All, you know, I know you guys who are listening to this on a podcast in the future, I'm, I'm putting my finger up to my mouth and pointing outward, putting my finger up to my mouth, identity. I'm speaking it. I'm speaking about your identity. I'm telling you who you are. I'm reminding you who you are. This is the ministry of the new covenant, the ministry of reconciliation. We're all qualified to teach this. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to do anything, but tell people, if you want to be qualified to talk about Jesus, you are qualified to preach the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says we are all qualified to teach this. And what is it? It's you're completely forgiven and you're righteous. It's both. Second Corinthians three, second Corinthians five. Read all that together. You are qualified to minister the new covenant. You're qualified. You know, this is... <laughs> when I first started my social media ministry, I had to come up with some type of little paragraph or a little tagline so people knew who I was. And I said, you know, I wrote on there, I'm a best-selling author um, and I'm a teacher of God's word. That part really never set right with me, but I didn't know how else to put it. Uh, I'm a teacher of God's word and I just left it just for Google purposes. I'm not a teacher of God's word. Uh, the word is Jesus. Now, are there teachers? Is that a supernatural gift? Yes, I'm probably a teacher. Um, you know, that's listed uh, in Ephesians 4 with, the, uh, with pastor and, and, and these other things. So, but I ne it never really set right right with me when I said I'm a teacher of God's word because the Bible never refers to itself as the word. You know, so many people say, I got to get this word, get this word in me and holds up their Bible. Get the word in you. <laughs> the Bible never says to put the Bible in you. The word is Jesus. The word is Jesus. You have the word in you. So when I, when I continually prayed about it and thought about it, I never came up with anything, but I changed it recently. I went back and I changed it on all my book covers. I changed it on my website. I changed it everywhere on all my social media platforms. And I changed it from teacher of God's word to minister of the new covenant. Why? Because second Corinthians three says I'm qualified to minister the new covenant. We all are. You're, min you're a minister of the new covenant. The new covenant is the ministry of reconciliation. So if I ever get on here and I ever give you any type of connotation that you're not reconciled with God or that you can't be reconciled with God, I'm not qualified to teach that. But everywhere on Sunday mornings, people are up on stage telling how even the congregation, you've messed this up. 
You got to do something to get back in good in God's good graces. You got to you got to repent. You got to insert whatever they're teaching. But they don't ever remind you who you are. They never tell you because of Jesus you're forgiven, because of Jesus you're righteous. Yeah, but I sin. God knows. But you're already forgiven, you're already righteous. Yeah, but it's an ongoing sin. God knows, but you're already forgiven, you're already righteous. If we made a bigger deal of what Jesus has done rather than what sin is, sinning would fade away. Because when you know who you are, you live that way. So when people are told they're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. You even got people up on stage saying, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the worst of all of you. I'm the biggest sinner of all of you. And by God's grace, I'm a pastor. <sighs> Well, I want to be a sinner and a pastor too. Do you see it? So we have all these bad examples set up of people using false humility and twisting scripture and, and um, confusing who they are with what they do. But if we just go back to the new covenant, which is the covenant Christ brought in at the cross, and we begin sifting through everything. Okay, that's a sinner. That's not me. Okay, that's a saint. That's me. Okay, okay. And you, as you read... You can read the Bible. You can rightly divide scripture, old covenant and new covenant. You don't mash them together. <sighs> Make sense? So are Christians sinners, saints, or a combination of both? Christians are just saints. You're just a saint. And I'm not saying just as in, oh, that's not a big deal. You're, that's, that's, that is your only identity. <laughs> You're, you're a saint. The only way you could be more of a saint is if Jesus decides to pour out some more blood for you. It, it's not going to happen. He did it one time. It's finished. You've accessed it in full. Okay? <laughs> so, so when you do stuff that, aren't, that isn't saintly, you need to... First thing, you, first thing you're not going to think of is, I need to do something. That's the first thought you're not going to have. When you understand the new covenant, when you sin, when you do something that's not natural for you as a holy person, the first thing you're not going to do, I, I got to do something. Or I got to go someplace. Or I got to see somebody. Those are the things you're not going to think anymore. You know, before I understood this, I thought I had to wake up the next morning and throw away all my beer. There, I did something. I repented because I got drunk again for the five millionth time. <laughs> I got to wake up and put a porn filter on my computer. There, I did something because I looked at porn again for the whatever time. <laughs> I got to get up and I got to go to church tomorrow because it's Saturday. Uh, I got to get up and go to church today because yesterday was Saturday and I really got smashed and I really got in arguments with people and I really did a bunch of stupid stuff. I cursed and I screamed and I, I gotta go to church so I can get right. I'm gonna be first in line. I gotta do something to get back in good graces with God. I never have those thoughts anymore. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> Do I still make mistakes? Absolutely, but I'm still free. I'm free. You don't do anything to achieve your sanctification. You don't do anything to Maintain your sanctification. You don't do anything to achieve your identity or sustain your identity. You have it. Now, if you want to get up and go to church, I'm not against that. <laughs> so many people, when they hear these free thoughts I say, they think I'm telling them to stop going to church. I'm not telling you to stop going to church. Go to church if you want to go to church. I'm saying, whatever you're doing, use this little three-letter word. Why? 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 It's so simple. And if the why answer creates stress, fear, or anxiety, that's not the new covenant. 
I have never met anybody who understood this and have just gone buck wild, sinning galore, you know, secret sinning, outward sinning. Don't see it. The opposite. The opposite. <laughs> Me. I have raised my hand. <laughs> it was when I was trying really hard that I struggled the most. But when I started to rest in my complete forgiveness, every time I'm messed up, I'm already forgiven, I'm already righteous. <sighs> That's when there was, there was some organic growth in my maturity. I'm still immature. I get that. I'm at peace with that. <laughs> I, you know, even that in itself is a struggle for me, you know, because I'm so critical. I'm so critical. I'm critical of myself. I'm critical of others. And it, that's a double-edged sword because it's really good for certain things. It's really good for business. It's really good for your health. It's really good for all of these things where a critical eye or a critical ear or a critical uh, mind will really make that a good thing. But when you apply it to your identity, that's where your criticism can really hit the fan. That's when the flesh, not our flesh, but the flesh can just have a heyday, you know? And I could, I could, if I still had that mindset of allowing such harsh criticism to continue, I would never do these walk talks. I would never write a book. I would never do anything. I would get up, have my coffee, watch Sports Center, have my yogurt, go play golf, go play basketball, um, do whatever. But there's no way I would talk about this. But as I understood <laughs> that I don't lack anything, I'm, I'm good to go. The early church, nobody had a seminary degree. They didn't even have a Bible. The Bible wasn't even written until what? 400 AD around there. So it's the spirit that teaches. There's no life in the Bible. There's no life in the scriptures. That will upset the religious mind. It was, it upset the religious mind to the Pharisees and the gospels. It's upsetting your religious mind. If you just took that personally, you have all you need for life and godliness. The Bible backs up the spirit within you. The spirit doesn't back up that book. That is a book. That's not the word of God. It's a book. Divinely inspired, perfect, right, true. There are billions of Christians who never even read a word in the Bible. Some can't even read. Stop looking to the Bible for God. Let the Bible back up God. It's that simple. It's hard. This is religious thoughts, religious thoughts. I get it. Trust me. I get it. If I would have heard that, if I'd have heard that sentence 10 years ago, I would have been like, what in the world? Because I heard it all the time. It's got to get the word in you. I got my sword. This ain't your sword. Your Bible's not your sword. It's the sword of the spirit. The word of God. Who's the word of God? Jesus. John chapter one. In the, all of these things are new covenant thoughts. All of these things. So as you come to understand these easy, truthful, burden-free methods of handling your identity, you're going to understand that you are a saint. So are Christian sinners saints or a combo of both? You're just a saint. You're just a saint. That's good enough. You're a saint. <laughs> and you'll always be a saint. So I hope this has encouraged you guys today. I hope it's brought to light some error that you might have been struggling with. Um, let's see if there's any other glaring passages that somebody might want to email me about in regard. Oh, okay, here's one. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter seven. I know this is going to come up. I know I'm going to get some comments or, or, or an email or two. Romans chapter seven is not Paul describing who he is now. It's the same thing as when he wrote to Timothy. He's telling a past, he's telling a present tense story of a past tense event. Okay. Read all of Romans chapter seven. 
He delights in the law. But yet in Romans chapter 10, he says, Christ is the end of the law for all who has believed. Romans chapter six, he says, sin will no longer be my master because I'm not under the law, but under grace. Delights in the law. When you read Romans chapter seven, Paul is not describing the life of a Christian. He's described, it's almost like he was writing all these things to the Romans. And then he talks about how his old self died. He's been united with Christ. He's died to sin. And then boom, he gets a religious thought. He starts to think about the time when he was the chief of sinners in his identity, back when he was a devout Pharisee, back when he was still obsessing over delighting in the law, sin afforded through the commandment. What was the commandment they were talking about in Romans chapter seven? Coveting. One of the Ten Commandments. It's the law. Miserable man that I am, who will save me? Boom. Jesus. Romans chapter 8. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Paul saying, I'm in Christ. <laughs> so Romans chapter 7 is not you, Christian. You're not a sinner. Don't go to Romans chapter 7 and say, this is me. I'm a miserable man. No, that's a, that's a miserable man under the law. Now, you will be miserable. If you're choosing to sin, but this is not your identity. This is not who you are. You're not a sinner. You're not delighting in the law. You're not looking to thou shalt covet. You have the spirit within you to guide you. Okay? <laughs> so, all right, guys. Um, always tell the truth about yourself. What is the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're forgiven. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a child of God. You're a saint. You are a saint. Always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all.